the first day that my dad came and climbed up those things, he said, oh, those things are pretty steep. And I thought, well, yeah, they are. You thought, classic dad. Classic, yeah, thanks, dad. <laughs> Welcome back to our show, everybody. This is the Essential Craftsman Podcast, and we are going to review the last two or three spec house videos and answer some of the questions that came through the comments and discuss a few of the parts of it that we might have done differently or that we might do the exact same next time. This means our stair video, the zip sheeting, and our winder stairs, mm -hmm. which that video is now up also. And there's, a, you know, it's all framing. So it, to me, it's feeling a little bit repetitive, but the truth is it's just it's so many different things happening in even inside framing that there's, yeah, there's really just it's not repetitive. It's just it's all framing and framing's pretty wide. Yeah, framing includes a lot of things. Let's start with the stairs, and we disclosed the the fact that those have to be removed. But now that now that that's kind of out on the table, how, how are you looking at those stairs? What what is there that didn't come through in the video that you might make sure the viewers uh, understand about that? And what's the what's your where's your mind at with mm -hmm. those stairs now? The viewers probably know that we are way behind the actual site condition with our uploads. And so we've been using those stairs and walking up and, and down them now for six months, probably almost. And there's no denying that I will go out of my way to walk to the middle of the house and use the winders because they are a friendlier experience. It's a friendlier mm -hmm. experience to walk up those winders yeah. at seven and five eighths by what, 10 and a quarter, what I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, then walking up that main flight. So that's the first thing is every time I go up and down those things, I think, hmm, yeah, not comfortable. I'm glad I'm going to replace it. But the, the morning that it showed up, I mean, it was, it was a shock. So number one, working in front of a camera is awkward and a little uncomfortable. And, and we did that. And that was one of our first really technical, we hadn't really tried to overtly teach as much as we tried to teach in that stair video, had we? Well, we kind of learned early on, you know, we both imagined the series going differently where we could build a little bit and explain what you're doing. But we learned like in the first day that it's just, just doesn't happen. It's not going to work that way because there's other people needing things and, and it, your, your attention needs to be fully on the process. So Yes, that was the first video that we kind of filmed with a mic on you yeah. and the camera kind of rolling with nobody else on site. And um, yeah, it show, shows you how well that worked. Yeah, so I, yeah, it does show you how well that worked. And I was, I remember how, how difficult that was to kind of try to order my thoughts to do the work, order my thoughts to describe the work, remain in contact with the camera while I'm remaining in contact with the numbers and actually making the marks on the board. And, but when we were done, I felt like, yeah, that went great. Those stairs fit nice and the rives are perfectly even from the bottom to the top. And I had a code number in my head, obviously that was wrong. I was just sure that we were within code. I don't remember now what I was thinking the number was, but I, I didn't, I just didn't pull it up on my phone to check it. And I was just sure when it was done that it was a home run. And mm -hmm. the first day that my dad came and climbed up those things, he said, oh, those things are pretty steep. And I thought, well, yeah. They are. You thought classic dad. Classic. Yeah. Thanks, dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then Daniel showed up. I don't think we had hired. Had, was Daniel no, he hired? he was there and he showed up and, and he and taped them. And he said, I think so too. I think they're a little bit too he steep. Said, I he said, I thought code was, was uh, seven and a half inch max. And I knew right away it was that seven and a half was not max, but turned out eight and an eighth was not within the tolerance and it was just such a sick feeling because ken jordan was there too and as it's as it sunk yeah. in that yeah these are wrong and the whole world's gonna learn it it did not feel I, good i think there was actually somebody else there as well was there that that moment when that kind of all happened ken was there and i want to say there was either a viewer or maybe ali was there but somebody. there was a lot going on and i remember I figuring out what happened with the stairs, you couldn't even actually do it. It was kind of like, okay, maybe anyways. So it, anyways, it yeah. was, it was not convenient. It was not a great, it was not a great moment. Yeah, um, your point about using the stairs is right. And I wish there was some kind of a counter because I bet you 80% of the traffic goes to the winders. Mm -hmm. I do. I was doing the same thing. Even when I was carrying like a piece of plywood upstairs yep. where a straight flight makes a lot more sense. I was looking for any excuse to use the winders. Yeah. 
And yeah. um, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and and as I watched that, I remember that I had so the plan the stairs were drawn on the plans, and we laid them out, and it was kind of crowding the entry. It was kind of restricting the room and the foyer and the entry. And I thought, man, we we need some more room in this foyer. And let me just run the numbers and run it back the other way and pull one tread out of it and see what it does. Yeah. Not knowing that I had made the previous mistake of starting the head of the stairs seven inches too far into the room or six yeah. and a half or whatever. And so the mistakes began to compound. And yes, we got more room down in the foyer and the stairs went in. And I sure that was, I was sure that was a fix. And then yeah. it's not. So we're going to add one tread. We're going to get the rise down to seven and five eighths. And uh, the run, I don't remember. I think it's going to be 10 plus, just exactly what the winders are. It should work. In the video, we we said that the stairs are a quarter inch off of code. They are an eighth inch off of code. Code mm -hmm. in around here is eight inches, period. Yep. And yep. ours are eight and an eighth yeah. of an inch. But they are short on the tread. They are half an inch short on the tread length. I see. So we were out on both sides and the they got to go. The, the funny thing is at this point, this is old news for us. We've been planning on ripping these stairs out for a long time. This is kind of like, oh, we're here we are talking about the stairs again. We've talked about this thing um, yeah. um, enough already. Ad but, nauseum. And, and, and I think for both of us, we're actually sort of looking forward to redoing them because filming it was hard. Um, making the videos was challenging, and we are better at making stair videos than we were before. So <laughs> yeah. probably it will be a better experience in every way than that first um, shot. Yeah. From here, I've got some comments from some, uh, viewers and we'll try to go in order of the sequence of the house. In other mm -hmm. words, the first thing we'll be talking about is some of the zip. All right. From Gene Rice. Nice. Enjoying the series. Only question I've noticed is the main power conduit coming up in the wall seems odd. I'm sure that it's local codes that required it. I'd like to have a better understanding from the powers to be on Y. So I guess he's wondering if the main power comes up inside the wall. It does, but it doesn't have to. Code does not require it. We require it. We could have brought it up outside of the wall and then run the siding behind it and it would just go right into the service panel right in the bottom. And it, that happens all the time. But it also happens all the time, particularly in nicer houses and especially on nicer houses where the panel is presenting right at the right right in your face yeah. that you bring that power feed up inside the wall cavity so the, the only thing that's projecting outside of the house is the glass meter base so that yeah. the power company can read the meter but the the panel faces to the inside so all the breakers and everything are at the stipulated height mm -hmm. inside the garage nice and dry and tidy and you don't have to look at it on the outside from Nick Halley so true. I've lain awake at night for many hours going through every different solution to the problems we'll face the next day. By the time I get to the job site, I know exactly what to do. No good just to turn up and start scratching your head. What, what was that like on this house for you? Uh, so first of all, as you were reading that, I was thinking of all the times. I, I ran into it the first time when I was building that sawmill as a kid. I remember being sleepless for a long time designing that. Since then, I've met a lot of people just like this fellow that use their hours when they should be sleeping, solving problems for the next day. Or sometimes we wake up, at least I have, when I woke up in the morning, I realized that I had the answer then, even if I didn't remember solving it while I was awake at night. But I just, <laughs> it's too bad we can't learn that in high school and college, right? So we could lay awake in those formative years when we have finals, and maybe maybe other people did. I wasn't that responsible to worry about answers to tests, mm -hmm. you know, when I should be sleeping. But the, the excavation, compaction, f foundation layout, and roof system were times, things that I s spent a lot of times staring at the dark ceiling thinking about. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, when you, when you get there in the morning, you've, you've got a, a running start that you can use. If you're an employee or if you work for somebody, um, this is a real luxury you have of, of not having to possibly mm -hmm. not having to think about things like this and show up at work and figure out what your task is and do that mm -hmm. task. And when you go home, you completely unplug. And I've had, I've had a lot of jobs like that and it's really nice. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of jobs and businesses where you, if you're awake, mm -hmm. yeah. even if you're interacting with your family or doing something else, it's dominating every mm -hmm. other corner yep. of your brain yep. and, and you can't, it's, this guy makes, makes it sound like, hey, I'm going to solve that problem. It's, it's more like you can't get it out of your head. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. So the, the, 
the ability to suspend a problem in your brain and rotate it and look at it from every possible angle is great, except that thing never stops spinning, mm -hmm. right? It's always there and you're always looking at different angles and, and uh, you're distracted. And so at least I am distracted and I'm not present. Even if I'm sitting there in a room with my people, I'm not present. And I don't blame them for resenting it. Do you think it's possible to kind of chew over something too much? I, I guess theoretically it certainly is. Because it's at some point, you don't have any traction. You're not figuring out anything new. You're just worrying about things that you maybe don't have enough information to solve. Yeah. Or you've already... And so, yes. But as far as looking for a, the best possible way to do something, I don't think there's ever a time that you should just fold your arms and say, well, I've got that figured out. Mm -hmm. Cross it off the list. There might always be something that could yet be figured out, maybe. 831 VTC. What sighting is going on? LP? Great Which, question. What, what's LP? LP is more OSB with paper and a, and a pattern embossed into it. And uh, L LP, Louisiana Pacific, had a huge class action lawsuit levied against them, what, 20 or 25 years ago now, because their first iteration of that siding just went bad. It just dissolved. If there was any water on it, it wouldn't hold paint. Since then, they have refined it to where they're not afraid of class action lawsuits anymore, which is a powerful incentive to improve a product. But we're not using it. We're using hardy lap siding, probably 8-inch. I, I would guess it's going to be 8-inch lap. We haven't bought any. Uh, the cost is really an insignificant difference in the different width boards. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a cement board siding. I've always thought of hardy board as like the premium high-end stuff, but actually that's just plain wood. Is that right? Just, that's right. Just nice. That's right. What What is it? Cedar siding? Cedar or redwood bevel siding. That is beautiful. Or cedar sidewall shingle siding is also mm. really great. And it would be nice to put those shingles up on the gable ends, but yeah. th we don't have an extra nine or $10,000 in the budget to do that. The downside to using the hardy, hardy cement board shingle siding is that there's so much waste when you start cutting into those rakes. Mm -hmm. You know, you cut across one of those three foot shingle sections and you may cut it in half and you never have another spot that you can use that that half you might have on the other side of the house but yeah. not necessarily so there's a ton of waste whereas and it's very lp slow. since they're in individual boards there's less waste is that right yeah or or just the lap siding themselves you can just run those right up a gable end but we're transitioning to a shingle look as soon as we get to the gable ends mm -hmm. it's a craftsman look and it otherwise that big south wall would just be so boring you know yeah we're, we're looking forward to getting the siding on just for reference the roof is on it's house wrapped and siding's kind of the next big appearance thing besides doors and windows but yeah the windows are be, in town we'll be putting them in next week probably yeah it's going to be fun to see siding on it and and like i mentioned um hardy board it really is a nice and i don't know maybe it's not premium but it's really nice it's a good one it's it's low maintenance yeah the, it the only downside to hardy is it's not all that it's not as impact resistant as lp is oh, lp is right. a wood product is a wood product so a kid can bat a baseball into uh -huh. it and it's just going to bounce off or maybe leave it a little Dent. Maybe leave a little, you know, yeah. something, but not much. But the so the downside to cement board siding, and it's better now than it used to be, is if it takes a serious point impact, yeah. like a kid with a hammer, he can do a lot of damage, you know, up to four feet that he can reach. Yeah. Okay, from Shafiq Mazlan, why the video is so short? I expect for more than 20, 30 minutes per episode. Sorry, Shafiq. Sorry to let you down <laughs> Sorry, there. Man. We don't really think about how long or how short they are, and I'm sure you guys are getting the feel for it. We kind of just, I don't know, we've sort of put out all the footage we have with as much interesting thoughts we can think to go along with it, and the, the length is no part of the calculation at all. Yeah, it's not. We we kind of bite off the content in, in the chunks that are sort of consistent and in the flow of the work and... Mm -hmm that it it just kind of breaks itself into the appropriate segments by itself and that's yeah. the length of the videos i kind of wonder what it'll be like later in the framing where oh, i guess we're already at that point but some of these processes it feels like we've shown a lot yeah and i filmed basically every inch of it so i don't know if we're going to show every board getting nailed in place on the second floor wall yeah. we're just going to have to play it by ear and may, maybe uh maybe you'll get lucky shafiq and there'll be a nice 30 minute episode. I, I like those long ones too. Honestly, when I'm watching YouTube, I like a video that's long cause you kind of can get into it a little more. And so I, I get it. All right. From Varnts, has it really taken two years to get this far on the house? 
Uh, yes. <laughs> Maybe. Not two years of sustained effort, <laughs> yeah. though. It's not that we've been working for two years. It's that two years plus has gone by. Yeah, it has. And there, we have videos explaining why there was delays and stuff. So if you're curious, you can figure it out. But it has absolutely taken two years, and it feels like it's taken longer than that. Now, having said that, we started the foundation in, what, the second week of May or first week of May? Yeah. And the shingles went on the roof Thanksgiving. Yeah. And that's still slow. Yeah. It's not incredibly slow for, you know, 3,000 square foot, cut and stack, custom house, tough mm -hmm. access, a crew of two. Mm -hmm. So it's not incredibly slow, but it was not fast because of the the time constraints that filming bring, brings in. I very much enjoy your framing videos, but it's really not sage advice, people, to figure it out like a puzzle and know that it will work out in the end. Reading and understanding what is happening in your plans from top to bottom is the key to framing a house. We, yeah. we made, we made a point that sometimes you got to kind of figure it out on the spot. <laughs> and I, th I think that's what he's speaking to. Yeah, I think so. I, I sometimes only half jokingly have, have told people that I should have named my construction business, starfish construction, not sure where I'm at, not sure where I'm going, but I'm still moving. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and there, that's not just sort of a joke, but the fact is that there are plenty of specific problems in any construction project of any complexity at all that are not drawn. The draftsman never answered all the questions. The architect didn't answer all the questions. They could, perhaps, if you went back to them and say, hey, I need more detail here, but they there's a whole level of effort and therefore expense that you have to be ready to authorize to have those guys solve the problems that you should be able to solve on the site. And on this particular house, there was that corner, that, that junction between the garage angle and the house angle in the floor and in the roof had a ton of questions that could not be answered until there was more to work with. And, and what, what this, this, um, viewer is speaking to is true. It's a mistake to start into a project if you don't understand the plans because you can make a mistake that was that you, that w well, my stair mistake. If I would have taken a minute to call and double check my adjustment to the plans and realize that, man, Gary had it right. He had maximum slope on those stairs remaining in code compliance. If I would have taken that extra step, I wouldn't have made that mistake, mm -hmm. but there, there are things that cannot be drawn yeah. or at least for a reasonable cost. It can be figured out if you go, you walk up to the edge of the light, right? Where you can see and you build that far and right then the light shines just a little further and you can take the next step. So I will defend my, my statement as saying, sometimes you have to figure it out as you go, but it's a mistake to be lazy and not find all the information that is included in the plans. Yeah. And you know, we should probably talk more about plans in a main video and we've, we've hit on this, but yes, the plans have all the details, but as we've already seen, well, maybe they haven't seen it, but there's been mistakes in our plans. Yeah. Some of which were, I'm, I'm not gonna say major, but enough that it was kind of like, whoa, definitely going to change that <laughs> next time mm -hmm. we send these plans out. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll talk about that more and, and other times where like the stairs where you made some assumptions like, Hey, it would fit better for this and that. And, and we're sticking. So it's almost like a balancing act of trusting the plans, mm -hmm. but verifying, but being willing to improve the construction since you're the guy standing there. That's right. In other words, the, the plans are not the gospel. That's right. And at the same time, it's not like a suggestion book. It's just kind of a balance. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great, that's a great comment that I've said it before and I'll say it again. I love the plans Gary drew, but there were two or three oversights that I caught. Um, actually one of them after I built it, there was a comment in there, why not balloon frame the wall at, at where the winders happen? Would have been good to balloon. There, that, that's a great suggestion. And turns out we could have and should have. It just wasn't drawn that way. Mm -hmm. But we caught it and fixed it. There were also a, a couple. Well, there so far there have been, I think, five framing mistakes. And we have, I think, called out and pointed out two. And there are three in the future. Not big, but had to be fixed. And there were three, I think, drafting or engineering um, missteps that were caught. So not bad. I mean, at this yeah. point, the house is is uh, just right, but it takes head work to get it there. Yeah. All right. From DSC, Scott, I always thought that pitch 
was that black sticky stuff that's left over when substances like petroleum, coal tar, and wood tar is distilled. Could there be regional differences in what is called sap? Okay, so about his comment, it, maybe that is pitch. I don't know much about petroleum or I, oil. I don't products. either. I, I think he's right. Coal tar and those things, I think it's also called pitch. Probably, but we, we showed a little shot of some pitch coming out of, our, <clears throat> out of the wall, uh-huh. and there was some good comments about pitch. Oh, in fact, let me just read this one from the... P.N.W. Wester, in other words, Pacific Northwester, he sounds like an authority. He says, tree pitch, depending on ambient temp, is amber colored, can be hard, and will break like glass in the cold, or be like thick honey when warm. Dried out pitch, even when warm, will crunch like a piece of hard candy. I think you only see it on evergreens. I think of sap as the clear, more liquid that can actually drip. Maple maple syrup is made from sap. That's pretty neat. (laughs) It's really good. So... The, the coniferous trees that grow around here all, when they're young, have little bubbles, little pitch pockets, sap pockets. The Up and down the, the trunk of a small Douglas fir tree are these little blisters be, between the size of a pencil eraser and the size of your little fingernail. Yeah. And if you pop them, clear sap runs out, and it's sticky. When you're a kid and you're playing with that, your hands are... are it, it's pretty awful. Yeah, And that is... I'm going to step out on a limb and um, assert that pitch, per se, is what happens as sap dehydrates, dries out, and sort of concentrates. And I don't know if that is the process that turns it it the amber color, but he's absolutely right. And amber as a sort of a, a jewelry product is fossilized pitch, fossilized dehydrated tree sap. And... So, yeah, I, I, I'm absolutely right in calling that stuff that was on the film pitch. And from a, you know, a shipwright um, perspective who would, who would use pitch to maybe line their, or, okay, Moses' little reed craft that his mom made and put him out on the Nile, she lined it with pitch. Mm-hmm. And I don't think they had Douglas fir trees or probably no coniferous trees down there on the Nile Delta. Mm-hmm. So that was something else that was sticky and kept the water out. So I think... Both of these things are true, but here is a here's a note if you're interested. If you're working with coniferous trees, pine trees, any of those, and you get pitch on your hands, butter will take it off. Good old garden variety, lactose tolerant butter will just dissolve and take pitch right off your hands. And then you get to spend the rest of the day trying to get butter off your hands. <laughs> yeah, or you can use gasoline, you know, a petroleum distillate, and you spend the rest of the day smelling like a gas station attendant. So yeah. pick your poison, right? Yeah. It's amazing how many comments come in and just people pointing out different words used at different places. And it's it's obvious that regional um, language in, re- in specific regions, even in the U.S., can have words can take yeah. on their own meanings. Yeah. You know, like it, I don't know where that guy's from, but he sounds like he knows a little more about petroleum and coal tar. I, I, I've never seen, I don't think anybody's drilling for oil or mining coal in Oregon, right? <laughs> That's they right. don't exist yeah. within yeah. 400 miles of here. Interesting. There were coal mines over by Coos Bay. Oh, really? Okay, really low-grade coal, and there are still some veins that crop out over there. This The the natural gas pipeline that we're fighting about, whether we take it from Coos Bay inland now, huh. um, they, they will go through some areas where there are some coal veins oh, when really? that goes in, yeah. No, that's neat. It, it, i got to learn more about geology. Yeah. Because um, it's pretty neat stuff. It's so <laughs> all it's like materials, you know, like lumber and coal and oil that are wrapped through the earth in yeah. different ways and veins. Yeah. Like the fact that it's in a vein, how how does that even happen? How does that happen? What what does that mean that it's in a vein? I, I bet there's a very easy like fifth grade style yeah geology one hundred and one. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That's probably pretty neat. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for t- tuning in, everyone. We're uh, we're really trying, and <clears throat> I think over the next few weeks you'll see us putting out a lot more of these spec house videos, trying to get caught up. Our goal is to get, like, as you know, the the house has a roof on it. It's going to have some windows in it pretty soon, but our goal is to get the videos caught up to that point before we really start um, taking it to the next step with the siding and doors and all the interior stuff. So anything else you want to add here? Just that it's been really nice to step back from production on the house. The house is secure. It's dry. The windows are going in next week. It's been great to get back into the blacksmith shop. Yeah. And I know it's good for you to have a chance to catch up on the content. You've got hard drives full of content that are just kind of getting cold on us, you know, the further away that we get. Mm-hmm. So we just made the decision. 
we have to stop with the house in order to get current with the process and the output of video. So we're going to work towards that yeah. blacksmith shop, catch up on some promised Bowie knives and a sword to a girl who's uh, been entitled to a sword. And we just made a, an ax and a collaboration with a bomb. It's not that one, but you'll yeah. probably see it on the channel here in a, I don't know, in a little while. So it's great to get in the shop and it'll be great to get back on the house yeah. in a month or two. We imagined beforehand, like we've said, that that the house would allow for live streams and, and kind of really fast turnaround. So the audience almost felt like you were kind of building it and just right there hap mm -hmm. watching it happen with us. And we're going to try to get closer to that in the second phase as the, as the siding and all the interior stuff happens. And I think it's possible because there'll be a lot more uh, subcontractors mm -hmm. doing work more people on the job which means it will probably go quicker and uh you'll be you know m more free to kind of narrate and talk through things and mm -hmm. who knows what but it, it probably won't be as demanding as the the framing was and there certainly isn't going to be the time pressure the way we felt so yeah we're optimistic that the second part will be a little more um engaging and if you're watching this live in other words as we're building it here in 2019 or 2020, um, you'll be able to enjoy that part of it, you know, kind of doing it along with us. It would have been a little different. I mean, our construction production crew, Nate was on the camera most of the time. I mean, he could he could bring stuff, but he was filming. So the production side of this pretty much was me and Daniel. That's a small crew. And the video production side was, was this guy. He was it. And hindsight now, we realize if our budget would have been, I don't know, 10 times bigger than it was we could have hired more construction help so that mm -hmm. could have moved forward while i was on the camera describing what was happening or if it would have been possible to hire more video production help mm -hmm. it might have freed you up to you know who knows what but the constraints and the opportunities just kind of conspired to here's where we are but i like the videos they've been a pleasure to make and the house is dry and the rains can't hurt us and here we go yeah. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you all next time. Uh, if you have specific ideas or things you'd like to see in this podcast, put them in the comments on EC2 uh, and uh, shoot us an email. Thanks for chiming in. We'll catch you next time.